Hello and welcome to this short module on asthma and COPD. I've divided this into two parts, both of which should be very short. Part one, I'm going to review the pathophysiology and the treatment guidelines and drug delivery options for patients who have either asthma or COPD. And what I hope you will see is that there's a good bit of overlap in both the pathophysiology and also in the treatment of both of these. Um, and additionally, I want to you know, touch briefly on some of the finer points of drug administration here. All right, now starting with the um, pathophysiology of um, asthma and COPD, we have here kind of you know our picture A, a picture of the lungs, and then here is a picture of the airway. And remember that the very smallest airways do not have any cartilage in them. They actually have smooth muscle that's arranged kind of in rings around the outside. And then there's some epithelial tissue here. And epithelial tissue is notable because typically this is what secretes substances. And in the airways, we have um, we can have quite a bit of secretion, mostly of mucus that goes on. And mucus and surfactant both are playing a role in maintaining the health of the of the lungs themselves, but also that's a very protective mechanism here. So the mucus can act to trap dust and particles and microbes that may have entered into the airways from the outside. So you can see in a cross section here that the airway here, muscle is on the outside, the epithelial tissue is here, and then in a patent airway, way it's open here you've got a good diameter there for the air to flow through. Now, during asthma symptoms as being shown here we see that the smooth muscle has contracted and this causes a constriction in the diameter of the airway. Additionally look how inflamed the epithelium has become. So the tissue has become thickened. We see more secretions here. This kind of response can be due to a number of triggers here, but this inflammatory or inflammation that you see is going to be a feature of both asthma and uh, COPD. And when you look at the cross section here of the airway, you can see that this, the muscle is constricted, making the overall diameter smaller. The airway has thickened, the epithelial tissue has thickened, um, and the mucus that is there in the middle, all of these things serve to decrease the lumen of the airway and decrease the um, amount of space that's available for air to get in and out of the uh, lungs in this way. So this next slide that I have shows a, a, just a, a table of some of the triggers for asthma. So you can see respiratory infection may trigger asthma due in part to inflammatory responses that can uh, be produced. Allergens also via classic allergic uh, pathways where you've got um, inflammatory responses that are produced as a result of something that's external or exogenous to the body. Additionally, environmental or occupational stimuli, things like chemicals or dust or smoke can um, induce epithelial damage and inflammation. Emotions um, can produce airway constriction. Exercise also can produce or trigger an asthma attack, mostly because of the loss of water and heat from airways. So people who exercise, particularly in the cold weather, may be more likely to um, experience this uh, kind of response. And then, of course, there's a number of foods and drugs that can be linked to asthma attacks as well. Now to compare asthma and COPD, we see over here on the left hand side, again this is just a very simple table here, um, asthma we often think of this as being a disease associated with children and one where there's a family history. Um, additionally you may see people who have allergies, particularly um, nasal allergies that may develop into asthma and also people who have allergies um, that are associated with an asthmatic response may also have certain skin responses as well. So these people are more likely to have eczema or dermatitis. We generally think about asthma as being reversible, a reversible airway obstruction. Now I want to take you to this site here. This is the National Heart uh, Heart, Lung, Blood uh, Institute here, and these provide the guidelines, the expert panel guidelines for the diagnosis and management of asthma. And this is a particularly good 
a resource for um, clinicians um, as well as basic science people and it provides you know guidelines and reports the best practices are here so this is very very useful okay now if we look at COPD we see that the onset is going to be different this is typically going to be in midlife and if you look at the association this is very strongly associated with smoking which makes sense then right so COPD um, also shows slowly progressing symptoms you know that have a slower onset and this is thought to be an irreversible or at least not completely reversible airway obstruction and uh, the two kinds of diseases that are normally associated associated with COPD are going to be chronic bronchitis and emphysema and both of these will be associated with chronic inflammation of the airways that lead to further damage and that further damage at the level of the alveoli and at the level of the airway are what lead to this irreversibility here now the this link here takes us to the gold Institute here the global initiative for chronic obstructive lung disease here this is a collaboration between the World Health Organization and the NHBLI National Heart Blood Lung Institute that we where we just visited here and there are a number of good resources and documents here additionally so both of these sites should be places that you would know to go to to look at uh, guidelines or other you know treatment options okay so there we go all right now in terms of uh, drug administration because these both are diseases both asthma and COPD are diseases that are associated with um, breathing many of the medications that are going to be uh, that we'll be talking about in part two are can be administered um, by inhalation and the most common device that is used to administer these drugs are going to be the meter dose inhaler and I would guess that most of you are going to be very familiar with this if we could look inside of it we would see that there's a canister here the drug is present in a solution and additionally there is some propellant some kind of propellant substance here and then there's this boot that surrounds this and um, if you um, have have patients or if you've seen this administered or maybe um, this is very common maybe you know somebody who uses one of these medications you know that the administration of these inhaled medications requires the patient to exhale to shake the device very vigorously to put the device in their mouth to press on the canister and then inhale rapidly to get the particles to penetrate into the airway tissue now what I'm showing here is that the particles that are going to be produced from this device are actually going to be variable in size so we're going to have some larger particles and then some smaller particles and the problem with this is that these larger particles they're heavier and so they can be deposited many many of them are going to be deposited on the inside of the device itself so you will see that there will be recommendations uh, for patients to clean the device or rinse it out with water and that's to remove that drug that has deposited there but additionally any of these particles that are maybe a little smaller than this may not be delivered to the airway tissue but they may be delivered and they may deposit in the lung or in the oropharynx of the patient where they're not really doing any good only the very smallest particles or droplet sizes are going to be delivered to the lung tissue directly or to the airway tissue directly where they can have an effect so this is a problem Additionally, as we talked about in using these devices, this requires a significant amount of eye-hand-lung coordination. So you may have patients that are disabled or patients that are young or patients that are older or patients who are confused who are not able to manage the administration of their medication uh, with this kind of device. So the next slides that I'm going to show you are some adaptive equipment and typically we associate these with children because children are very likely to have asthma. However, I want to emphasize to you that any patient who may have an impairment in their eye hand lung coordination could use these. The first is a spacer and you can see this right here. 
And a spacer is particularly useful with um, medications like inhaled corticosteroids. And the purpose of this spacer is actually to prevent the larger particles that are coming from the canister here from being deposited in the patient's mouth and oropharynx. So only the very smallest particles will go through the spacer and then be delivered um, into the uh, tissue. This next device that I'm going to show you is a nebulizer. And in a nebulizer, you can see the device is here. The drug is administered as a solution into the device and the nebulizer aerosolizes this into very, very fine particles that are then going to be delivered through the tubing into the mask where the patient can simply inhale them. There are a number of benefits here. So this does not require any kind of coordination on the part of the patient and the particles that are going to be delivered are going to be much smaller, which means that you're going to have much better penetration into the tissue. Furthermore, because the particles are smaller, this means that the response is going to be much smaller. The drug is administered over a longer period of time, so you get much better response. And in fact, even in patients who maybe have not responded well to their inhaler, they may respond better to the same drug if it's administered in a nebulizer. All right. Now, the last thing that I want to show you are some of these uh, more novel uh, administration devices here and there are some that are single dose device devices and then multiple dose devices. So in a single dose device the patient gets a single dose and this may involve your patient having to put a capsule or some other kind of container into the device. They have to pierce the capsule and then they inhale the fine powder uh, directly into the airway tissue. Um, in all of these devices the, the drug is formulated it is a fine powder, which is useful, um, and the, the particle size is going to be very much smaller. In these multiple dose devices, then um, the, you have multiple doses that are already present. The drug, again, is present as a fine powder, and also these devices are going to be activated by inspiration as well. So as soon as the patient inhales, then the drug is administered into the, into the airway tissue. This requires, these devices require a good bit less eye, hand, lung coordination, um, and the powder is a much finer particle size, which means you have better penetration. However, you don't use a spacer with these devices, and they can be much more expensive. Furthermore, this also requires education. Um, of your patient on the proper way to use these devices so that they don't mistakenly um, dump the powder out of them or take the capsule as an oral instead of putting it into the device that they, they can use the device properly. All right, so then uh, we'll move on to part two in a separate, um, uh, a separate form. So thanks very much. I'll see you in just a second.